instant Browns classic. Hey, whatever it is, hey, that's what this game's about. Good whatever day I release this episode to you guys out there and welcome in to another episode of the Barking Brown Show. I'm Jacob, Mr. Casey Kinneman. We're brought to you by our friends over at SeatGeek. Hey, it's summertime. Football's right around the corner. Awesome, a lot of awesome concerts. And maybe you want to go to SummerSlam up in uh, up in Cleveland on August 3rd. Maybe you want to go to SummerSlam. Maybe you want to go to see Creed when they're up in town uh, in November. Uh, yeah, what a, get out. Go over to our friends, get your tickets over at SeatGeek, use our promo code BARKINGBROWNS, all one word, uh, get $20 off your purchase. Casey, how are we doing this evening? Dude, I'm great. Uh, I know you can't tell because of my lighting setup, but your boy's cooked. I got so damn sunburned yesterday, um, but uh, I'm, I'm surviving, man. It's it's hot down in South Carolina. I'll just leave it at that, uh, but I'm excited, man. I got the man, the myth, the legend behind me, rocking his shirt, get this shirt at homage, uh, but... I'm excited to talk ball, man, and we got a dope guest lined up for tonight. Yeah, guys, if you're checking us out on uh, YouTube, make sure you hit subscribe, give that thumbs up. Uh, if you're watching the YouTube, there's a our uh, logo's in the bottom right-hand corner, and you can just click on that, and that'll subscribe to the channel. Uh, get us out there. You go to my, uh, my Twitter, at Rochism13, right now until Wednesday. I'm giving away a copy of NCAA football. I'm sorry, it's called College Football 25. I think it's in – I got – I've been yelled at. It's not NCAA 25. I That's what I want to call it. But I'm giving away a free copy if you're subscribed to the YouTube channel. So go check that out. Uh, but we continue. We continue on our uh, draft or our 2024 previews for the Browns opponents. And tonight, Philadelphia. Is yeah, man. The Eagles are up. And, uh, man, I, I stumbled upon this uh, next guest a couple years ago during the Senior Bowl, man. And I'm always, I'm, I'm always looking for stuff, little bits, like what, what all is going on. And I've seen this this thread just kept coming through on my feed, man, of, of everything that was happening. It was like I was pseudo there. You know what I mean? So I, I, I threw, threw the cat a follow. And it was like the most informative follow that I had the entire draft cycle. And it just continued. This kid is a beast. He's just pumping out content. So – I will do no further. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we have John Vogel. He is the co-host of the Sick Podcast with Draft Vogel. He has a kick-ass draft guide, and he's an Eagles fan, so he's going to come here and help educate you guys. What's going on, man? Appreciate, appreciate the uh, intro there, and uh, thanks for the opportunity, guys. And I'm um, always excited to talk ball. I think everybody knows that at this point. Hell yeah. It's, a, it's the best thing to do on a, on a weeknight in July. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and, you know, with College Football 25 unlocked now, now we can, you know, kind of satisfy that football, you know, fix a little bit, just a little bit. It makes us feel a little bit closer to the beginning of the season. So, you know, it's fun. Well, and you get uh, – we're recording this on a Monday. It's probably going to drop on Thursday. But, like, recording this on a Monday, you get um, Keaton Mitchell for the Ravens goes on the physically unable to perform list, which – all, the only reason I bring that up is there are football transactions happening that are not just like trading for a random mm -hmm. guy and like cutting your the 90th man on your roster for a different guy. No, there are some actual player of movement today. And it's like, oh, all right. So Casey, kick it off, man. Let's let's uh, let's dive in on the Eagles. Let's talk Eagles, man. So two years ago, the Eagles go to the Super Bowl. Both their coordinators get plucked. They plug some new guys in, and it just didn't really work. There wasn't a fit. Now, I don't know how much of that was Hurts getting injured and not being able to perform, but for me, it felt like the offense was pretty elementary. So mm -hmm. they do a drastic change, man. You go get Kellen Moore. Mm -hmm. So Kellen Moore is now the OC. What do you see that marriage with Jalen Hurts working out like? What do you see that as? It's, it's going to be an interesting fit because it's totally different than anything that the Eagles have run under Jalen Hurts. You know, if you go back to um, that Super Bowl, you know, run, the offense was very elementary at the time, too. And it was simply, hey, we're better than you. We're going to run our plays and you just stop us. And nobody could. And they came back out in 23 and did the same thing. And it wasn't until San Francisco 
kind of figured out how to disrupt the middle of the field and and you know clog the cloud the picture for Hertz that they were able to teams were able to find a way to slow them down. So the this move on to Kellen Moore is Nick Sirianni basically saying, hey, the whole idea of we're just better than everybody is not going to work anymore. And so you're going to bring in a guy that really understands passing concepts and how to scheme people open through sort of a vertical slash West Coast style. It's it's a it's a blend of a couple of different um, you know schools of thought that Kellen Moore kind of tips tends to put together. So I think one, it's going to be interesting to see what Philadelphia does in their read progression scheme. You know, previously they've always had a read the the top coverage and then go straight straight to the beater. That's how they draw their plays. So you got a beater for man coverage for too high in zone. You know, if you got a Tampa two, you make an adjustment. Everything is adjustable to the defense that was running. And that's what, you know, um, their coordinator that year, 22, put together, the one to, uh, Shane Steichen put together, right? When he went to Indianapolis, he took that with him, his understanding of how to kind of craft this thing to beat these specific types of coverages and all within the same play. Um, so that's what really helped Jalen get through his processing and understand what was going on. Yeah, the, the knee injury definitely hurt him a little bit last year, too. Took away a lot of his mobility. I think it was a lot more serious than most people realize at this point. Um, and the Jalen is going to let people know, honestly. But it would. I think it's going to be. It's going to come down to what the read progression system is going to be. Are they going to go back to a traditional one, two, three, and check down, or are they going to try to keep it so that Jalen's reading a meter and then going to that play? I don't know what that looks like. Um, if I had to guess, they're not going to stick to that. They're going to go to a more traditional read system. And I wonder if that hurts Jalen mm-hmm. in the long term. Yeah, because it's some of those things can just for whatever reason just flat out not work, even if they work everywhere else. So yeah, I, I'm very interested. I, I like Kellen Moore. The Browns were in the, in a position to bring in an offensive coordinator and try to kind of evolve the offense. They of course go the route of Ken Dorsey. So. I'm very interested to see what Kellen Moore does there just because he just came from having Justin Herbert. So he's had a quarterback. I think, I think Hertz is more mobile than Herbert, but Herbert's got a little bit better movement skills than I think he, he sometimes gets credit for. So I, I'm really interested to kind of see how that blends together. Cause I think it's just, I mean, if it doesn't work with the quarterback and the coordinator, we've seen all too many times, you know, how that works. But um, I want to. This is a great wide receiver group. I I think mm-hmm. you got the top, probably the top duo. I mean, I don't know. Maybe Tyreek and and Waddle make a push for it down south. But like uh, AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, like that's. And you add Paris Campbell and a couple of young guys. I like Johnny Wilson a ton. Just mm-hmm. especially because you got him in what the, he's a sixth round pick. Yeah, you get him mm-hmm. in the sixth round pick. So. Do you think this ultimately the the marriage between Kellen Moore's offense and, and the way he kind of wants to spread some of these things out? Do you think it matches up well with this wide receiver core? And are you kind of excited to see what they can do in this system? Absolutely. You got AJ Brown, who's your big physical guy. You know, think of a. It's really hard to compare him to somebody because I kind of think yeah. Alshon Jeffrey, but he's faster than Jeffrey ever was, and he's a lot quicker through his breaks. Uh, whereas Jeffrey was more of a linear runner. AJ is really sp- very strong through his breaks. And then, you know, Devontae is an absolute, the slim reaper. You know, he's yeah. he's an absolute killer as a route runner. He's awesome. Uh, like even joystick, essentially, when he gets to the top of his break. Um, Paris Campbell, I think, is going to kind of be your core Daryl Patterson. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? In this type of offense where you're going to use him to be your mismatch. And, and it's, look, it, everything right now in the league is all about mismatches. What kind of mismatches can you create? So if you can roll out Paris Campbell, Devontae, AJ, okay, defense is looking at the huddle here going, all right, they're in 11. We've got Saquon in the backfield and Dallas Goddard. And all of a sudden, Paris Campbell lines up in the backfield with Saquon, and they put two receivers out wide. Got, Goddard splits into the slot. Now you're in a 20, uh, basically 21 personnel grouping and did you match that as a defense you know so I think that's the type of stuff that they're going to kind of try to play around with 
And then when you have the opportunity and you've got a small nickel that you're going up against, well, psh, that's where Johnny Wilson's going to have to come in to the play. If mm-hmm. assuming that, you know, he, he makes that 53 man roster, he's active on game day, but that may not happen early on in the season, but that's what you're going to use him for is strictly. We got a mismatch opportunity. This, this, you know, nickel defender, he's five, nine, five, 10. We're going to put six, six on him and just shoot him up the entire game and, and force them to rotate that coverage down. That's going to open opportunities in theory for Devonte to work the other side of the field, AJ Brown, if you wanted them to. So it's all going to be about making mismatches and, a lot of teams in the league, I think, are going to find ways to take 22 personnel and roll out in an 11 formation. And so once – I think if, if Kellen is planning on doing that, they've got a lot of tools in the, in the building that they can do that with and become very effective at it. Well, you boys mentioned my guy's name, so I'd be remiss if I didn't have the opportunity to talk about Johnny Wilson with you. Um, so – and, and feel free to push back if you see this differently. I just I want to get your take on this. I, I viewed mm-hmm. Wilson as like the ultimate power slot, a guy who can mm-hmm. feast on the inside, doesn't shy away from contact, great catch radius. Like he was a guy I was super high on in that, in that mid-round range. Did you see him similarly? Because a lot of people wanted to put him in that tight end bucket, and I I want nothing to do with this kid blocking a soul. You know, I, I <laughs> but, but I, I see him as a walking mismatch, you know, and obviously he – he has the size. He could also be a threat in the red zone. What do you think his growth will look like in the league now that he's that he's drafted? He has to. The I think the the, the problem the the reason he goes in the sixth round is because people saw him work the outside. He's not a he's not a one one side receiver mm-hmm. as a route runner. So what you mean by that is when I mean, you got the sideline, this guy is not a guy that works back to the football very well. You know, if he has to work one side of the sideline and he's got this, he really needs a two-way opportunity, which is why the slot makes sense. Mm-hmm. I agree completely. He He's an excellent power slot guy. He's not a tight end, all right? And the power slot is something that's becoming very, very important. In fact, in my draft guide this year, I've got – I'm grading guys specifically to be big slots. You know, if they're kind of on the smaller range for the tight end and they're good receivers, they, fought, they fit in there. Or if they're just really big Xs, you know, what we traditionally use as extra receivers that don't have the speed, they're going into the power slot. So that's a, that's something that everybody's trying to get a hold of, and it's really because Chase Claypool exploded with the Browns in his rookie year for 10 touchdowns playing the power slot. That was not a receiver that a lot of people had their eyes on that year in coming out of the draft. And so people are looking for that. Dalton Kincaid at Buffalo is a simply is basically a power slot. Sam Laporta was used in that role a lot. This it's a role that's expanding dramatically across the league. You could even make an argument and say that's really what Travis Kelsey is, though he can block. They don't like him blocking because of his effectiveness out of the slot. So, if you also you also have to think about how the game evolves, right? The evolution of the game is very important to understand. Bill Belichick will t- tell you that. Everybody that's been around the football for a long time will tell you that. And so, how did the slot receivers start? Well, Wes Welker with the Patriots got mismatches against tight uh, linebackers and safeties. So they had to put an extra corner on the field. And they were like, okay, well, when everybody started rolling slot receivers out there, the little receiver guys they didn't know what to do with, they put them in the slot, use their quickness underneath, right? Well, now you got defenders that match that. Yeah. So how, what is the next level that you do to create that mismatch? Oh, they're all small in the nickel. Most guys that you put in the nickel are smaller defenders. Well, we're going to put a 6'6", six, 6'5", six, six, tight end out there, essentially, that's a re- wide receiver, and let him – attack the vertical seams and put that stress on because now who who matches up against that guy. So that's, I agree with you completely. I think Wilson is that power slot. He's excellent when he's got both sides of the field that he can work. And, you know, you, you really struggle to figure out where he's going to go when he's working the sideline. It's easy. You just hold him to the sideline and hope that the quarterback doesn't make a perfect throw. That's easier, right? But when you got a two way inside and you don't know which way he's going to go, is he going to break in or out? And he still has all that field to work with. He's very difficult to deal with. So I think he doesn't play initially just because six round picks very rarely get up in there. He lacks some speed. Um, and I think that was another reason why he goes in the sixth round because people are looking at him. This is an outside body type, but he doesn't have the speed to, or really the route running ability to, to win as your number one on the outside. And so it was sort of a, with the receiver class that we had, 
he took the, the fall essentially down to the sixth round and then the Eagles just snatched him up there. But I do think they have plans for him. It's probably two, three years down the road as mm-hmm. he continues to develop. You really hope that that over the rim ability that he has is his deciding factor that keeps him in the league because we really thought Hakeem Butler was going to be incredible when he came out of Iowa State. Yeah. And he was not, <laughs> you know, he was not fit for the league at the time. He's had a good career in the XFL, UFL. Um, but you just, that's what you're hoping he, that's what I'm very hesitant about. I hope he's not another Hakeem Butler where he can't separate. And, you know, I think, he, I think as long as you keep him in the slot, he'll be fine though. The, the, I still can't get over the, the Saquon Barkley going in the division thing. Yeah. Like I just, mm-hmm. like as one of the, pettiest people on on planet earth i respect the hell out of it like i was like oh yeah i would love to do that if i was in that especially oh man that 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 first hard knocks episode man that was that was i have a, a good buddy that's a giants fan and that was a tough it was a tough watch for that reason <laughs> but <laughs> i look at what jalen hurts has done with those RPOs with those zone reads with those kind of quarterback options and those sort of things. And I'm like, I think this is the ultimate chess piece next to him and Saquon, like who's just like, I would like, like, let's say Saquon was a little smaller, didn't have the durability to be a running back. I'd play him in the slot. Like I'd play him as a wide receiver. Like I think he's got that kind of route running and, and uh, savvy to attack a defense where he can do those sorts of things. And now he's like, yeah, like now I'm just going to be next to one of the better zone read quarterback option RPO quarterbacks that we've seen in the last five years. Like, is that so? Are you salivating at that idea of putting of putting that backfield out there on Sundays? Yeah, I think Saquon, when he's healthy, has proven he's the top five running back in the lake. Right? I think um, with his with his ability, even with that offensive line really struggling with the Giants last year. Still managed to be decently productive while he was on the field. Um, and he's developed as a receiver, you know, so that's the other aspect to his game. He, he didn't come into the NFL as a re- necessarily a, a great receiver, but he started to really develop that aspect of his game. He, he loves coming to Philly. Um, his family's closer to Philly. So this is like him almost coming home. And I really can't wait until that Hard Knocks episode comes out where we get to see the Giants freak out because he didn't come back to him, you know, to, to get the deal, you know? So, but that's why, because he knew that they weren't going to match it. And he knew that Philadelphia really wanted him, And he knew that the opportunity was there for him to go win a Super Bowl. Like that's what this is about. Right. So it was a better opportunity for him to go get a championship, get that ring. That really would pretty much solidify him. I think, you know, as one of the top running backs of this generation, you know, or this decade, I guess, would probably be a better way to put it. But he's up there, and I, I am very excited about it. I think um, he's going to be a huge part of the scheme. I think that Jalen's going to be able to – we've seen Jalen work with some running backs that we wouldn't necessarily consider top tier, but then all of a sudden they get around Jalen Hurts and they're going off and they're getting paid. You know, DeAndre Swift was kind of in that point of his career where – is he going to make it? Is he going to be a running back in the league? Or is he going to be just this rotational piece? And all of a sudden he comes out, runs for what, 170 yards against the Vikings. And now he's a Chicago bear bringing in a lot of money a year for a running back. So um, that's kind of where I see him is Saquon saw that opportunity. He, he understands football and he knows that him Jalen in the backfield is going to be a lot for a defense to deal with, especially when you start thinking about the other mismatches across the field offensively. It's really going to all come down to Jalen. Is he going to be able to continue to progress as a passer, which he has done tremendously up to this point? He still shows me. I was a huge Jalen guy when he was coming out of college. And this is very well documented because I was one of the very few people had first round grade on Jalen Hurts coming out. And uh, took a lot of flack for it, let me tell you, too. People were not happy about that. But um, Jalen came out here and he's shown that he can get better. He still shows me things every game. It feels like that I didn't know he could do. That means he's getting better. So he hasn't hit his ceiling. So if his ceiling is truly as unlimited as it, as he's shown up to this point, this is a guy that's going to absolutely kill uh, a Kellen Moore offense. It's just that unknown, you know, where you just want to kind of hold back and say, 
is this going to be something that he can adjust to just from the mental aspect of it, reading the field, understanding what's around him. And so far the statistics I think would show he's, he's a little more limited in that aspect of his game. I want to talk trenches for a split second here before we jump to the other side of the ball. And Mm -hmm. I view the Eagles as playing with like, you guys are playing with an extra down essentially. And I I despise (laughs) the term tush push. I'm going to call it the brotherly shove. And Jason Kelsey retiring. So now Cam Jurgen steps in. Do you think that's still an element of of the game? Or do you think, do you think it's baked in so much to the, to the personnel that is something they will rely on? Or do you think Kellen Moore will shy away from it and that we won't see them operate in that manner anymore? I think you're still going to see it attempted at the very least. I don't know if it'll be as effective, you know? So the one thing that people don't understand about Jason Kelsey, I think, you know, from a a casual fan standpoint is how damn effective he was Mm -hmm. in the trenches, reading defenses and affixing the line to get the proper matchups that they need to, to make a play successful. He was a huge aspect of that. So uh, I, I think that there's going to be a little, an element where Jurgen's trying to adjust is going to have to learn. They've got some smart and talented people on that line. Obviously both the tackles have been playing for a long time. They understand the, the, the offense very well and, and defenses and how they need to block, you know, it's a, they can help, but a lot more of that is going to end up falling on Jalen now because Jason's not there to cover it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think they're going to try it. Now, Cam Jurgens was drafted to replace Kelsey when Kelsey eventually retired. So this is what they've been working on. This is what Kelsey's been working with him on. So you hope that he's ready to take that step. Landon Dickerson's a great aspect. So if things kind of start to go wrong from the center aspect, you always know that you can kick Landon inside the center, kick Jurgens back out to guard, and you're probably going to be okay. You know, so... There's a, there's options here if things start to go wrong, but I think that Cam's been built for this. Yes, they're going to try to keep it, I do believe. I really do believe that because it is a, a foundational piece of that offense over the last couple of years. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. No, no, like, like you, everybody knew it was coming, and yet, it, like, people would complain, oh, they just keep doing it. And it's like, hell yeah, they keep doing it. Like, dude, like. If, it works. I mean, yeah, it works, and you like Casey said. I mean, it's it's an extra down in the most crucial areas in the red zone, fourth down. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like whenever they needed that yard, you were just like, all right. If you can't if you can't get them to like fourth and five, well, start over again. Here we go because they're just gonna they're gonna get the <laughs> two yards. We're gonna start the chain over. We'll do it again. Yeah, fuck yeah, man. Like I'm not. No, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's the stupidest. Like that's, yeah, whatever. All right, that's that's my little rant about it. Like it, it's just, I stuff like that annoys me. It's like if it's working, man, I don't care if you're annoyed by it. Keep doing it. It's it, it's it's, well, it's such a copycat league too, and just it's there. It was their personnel, and I just wonder how much of that was Kelsey that made yeah. it special for them that other people just can't adopt it because we saw like with the Wildcat back in the day. Yeah. We saw one team do it, and all of a sudden, everyone's got a variation, and it worked to some degree or another. But it's not been true with with what they're able to do and play with an extra down. It just changes how you approach second and long when you have when you know you're playing with house money because you have, in essence, an extra down. Um, but we're gonna kind of th- there's a parallel between the Browns and Eagles. They're kind of built the same organizationally from the top on down. How they build their teams in the trenches and build out. And we'll go to the defensive side of the ball. You guys kind of took a page out of what the Browns just did by going and getting a savvy old veteran defensive coordinator in Vic Fangio. The personnel's mm-hmm. in place, in my opinion. When I look at the Eagles roster, that's yeah. that's scary. <laughs> to hand that person out of Vic Fangio. Shit. I think I think teams are in trouble, man. I think I think that's where the Eagles are really going to surprise people. I think Kellen Moore will get the headlines because he's like the next guy in waiting, and there's weapons over there. But if you look what Vic Fangio has at his disposal, man, I I think teams could be in trouble. What, what do you envision for this defense in 2024? Fangio struggled in Miami because the players weren't motivated enough to take his coaching. Vic is the type yeah. of guy that's not going to ever lie to you, but he's going to tell you straight. Exactly the way that it is, whether it sounds nice or not. He's just going to tell you. And so that didn't fly over with some of the players down there in Miami, and that was part of the problem that the, that they had with their defense was people just didn't take it as seriously. 
Philadelphia, you look at Jalen Hurts and those leaders in the locker room, they all mesh together because they all keep demanding more out of each other. And it's a very, very strong culture, and it's a perfect culture for Vic to walk into. So, yeah, I agree. The personnel's there. They went out and also addressed the secondary concerns, grabbing Cooper Tajin for the nickel, <laughs> grabbing Quinion Mitchell for the outside. To add to, you know, Bradbury and Darius Slay, like they, yeah. they loaded up, and they did a great job doing it. And then got the bonus pick in the fourth round to go get a legacy player in uh, Jeremiah Trotter Jr. Yeah. But so they're, they loaded on defense. They absolutely have the personnel – to fit that. And it's not going to take much of an adjustment. It was a perfect opportunity for Vic to segue into it. Now, if you remember last year, Vic was trying to come to Philadelphia and they were, they were, they basically threatened and said, Hey, if you go to Philadelphia, we're going to charge you with tampering because we know you were. So he waited a year, goes to Miami and then comes back when they can't get him for tampering, which is smart. But regardless, yeah, Vic is going to kill it. They didn't have to change that much from a defensive standpoint because a lot of what they were doing, even though it was a base 4-3, mm-hmm. was putting a five-man front out there and using the fifth defender, Hassan Reddick, as sort of that rush edge, right? So now you got Nolan Smith Jr., you go add Bryce Huff and let you know Reddick go off the, the Jets. But now you've got that rush edge. Those defensive linemen are already in place, and now you got the linebackers to really clean it up. They picked up getting Devin White, getting Zach Bond, adding Trotter already having the Kobe Dean as well. So, yeah, they're too deep, I think, on de- defense, pretty much across the board now. Those young corners that really struggled last year, they're not going to be running match four anymore. I'm just going to say that much, right? Because match four was what Philadelphia was running, and everybody started doing it across the league, and now match four is taking over. Vic's going to do away with that. He doesn't, he doesn't want that stuff. He's more of a, I'm going to line up in one high and do everything from a one high look pre-snap. So it's these guys are going to have more opportunities to kind of hide what they're doing and, and mask essentially what they're doing a little bit better, get themselves into a better position, make a play, and force more mistakes out of the quarterbacks that they're facing. So this defense is going to be very fun. That's a great point you bring up, Casey. You're exactly right. Um, this is a perfect, perfect situation for Vic to walk into. I want to I want to talk about Nolan Smith real quick. You mentioned him there, kind of probably not the start most of us thought he was going to have. Uh, you know, he's co- he comes in as a rookie coming off that injury and missing that time. And then, like, he didn't mm-hmm. play a ton and some things. Are you worried at all about Nolan? Because, like, I, he was edge one for me in that class a couple of years ago. Like, that was my guy. And you talk about the personnel mi- mixing well with fan, with fan, fan, come on. Vic, fan, Vic Fangio. There we go. Mm-hmm. All right. So, like, words don't do so well sometimes. But are you concerned about his overall trajectory, or do you just, you just kind of think, hey, buckle down, be, get healthy, play in this system that can really utilize his strength, and he'll be all right? He doesn't even really have to start, Jacob. I think people look at starting as, oh, yes. you have to, you have to start to be a great player. Not anymore. Not on defense. Yeah, everybody's running rotations. He's going to be rotating with Bryce Huff. Huff will be the starter. Huff's been playing for a long time. I really liked Huff when he came out of Memphis several years back, too, and thought he was one of the more underrated players in that draft. And he's developed very, very well at this level. So Huff's going to fill that spot, and they're going to rotate with Smith. And I think with the, you know, you're talking a 4 3 9, 40 yard dash type speed out of Nolan Smith coming off the edge after you deal with Bryce Huff already. Yeah. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> no, the change up to be able to put out there and all of a sudden you got a speed mm-hmm. demon. When you're saying that kind of gets me thinking, do you, basically the Eagles are like Georgia East on defense. Jordan Davis, Jalen Carter, N'Kobe Dean, Nolan Smith. Mm-hmm. Like that is a hell of a pipeline. Really it's, it's crazy. It's crazy yeah. how they've developed that. Um, so let's go to the interior there with Jordan Davis and Jalen Carter. Jordan mm-hmm. Davis, I guess a lot of people had higher expectations. You see the size, you see the power that he plays with. Freakish testing for some for a, a dude that size. But Jalen Carter was kind of considered he might have been the best value the year before in the draft. You know, just where he went versus the talent that he brings. I think both those players, and and now also with Fletcher, big Fletch, you know, moving out. Those are the guys that are going to be expected to to take that role. What do you see as their upper bound limits? I mean, I, I see Jalen Carter as a potential all pro. Do you do you see it similarly or do you see more more growth that needs to happen 
before they reach that level. I think I think he's got to build up his stamina a little bit better. That's one thing you can critique Georgia defenders for on their defensive line. They don't play a lot of snaps. Yeah. You know, even Trayvon Walker, when he came out, was a 350 snap a year guy, you know, playing the Georgia because they rotate three deep there. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jordan Davis is kind of a stamina thing where if you could keep him to about 25, 30 snaps a game at your, as your true nose, he's going to be great. And that might be enough to make him an all pro if he could be productive in that spot. But that's not really what you're asking him to do. You know, you're asking him to clog up that middle, take two blocks. If you can engage both of those guards in the center, then even better, because you want to get that one-on-one opportunity as best as you can, Nolan Smith or Bryce Huff on the outside. And if you can get him on a tight end, even better. You know, that's what that's what pissed me off when I see, like, Dan Orlowski. I love Dan, but he, he's got a couple things wrong because he's not understanding his defense too well, I don't think. When he's like, just stop blocking edge rushers with tight ends. Okay, well, if we don't block the edge rusher with a tight end, we got a nose tackle in the middle that we're going to leave one-on-one with our center. So we got to slide the protection down and take that out. What, what would you rather have, Dan? Would you rather have Jordan Davis crashing on your interior and just breaking your leg, or would you rather have take the opportunity to maybe make the outside guy miss? Yeah. You're going to take the outside guy every single time. Yep. So that's what they're going to try to do. Jordan Davis is really going to be your, your, your run stuffer, your block eater on the inside, opening up those gaps for the linebackers and run defense, and then trying to take those blocks to get those outside opportunities, you know, for your Bryce Huff, for your Nolan Smith, for Brendan Graham, you know, that will probably kick out to more of a five than a, you know, five and maybe in the seven tech a little bit in this defense. Um, but Jalen Carter, same type deal, right? He's another one of these guys that's on the interior of your defenses that you're trying to get double teams with, you're trying to attract that attention, force them to block him, you know? And, and if you look at kind of what happened there at the end of the season, I think he would got a little banged up too, but he was playing more snaps. He was, they were trying to keep him on the field a little bit more. Their rotation wasn't as, as successful the defensive coordinator changed midseason to someone that probably never should have gotten the play calling duties, but they were trying to they were trying to change something up and fix it. So I'm not worried about the interior either. I think that those guys they're going to play their role. If they end up being productive out of it, even better. But you're really trying to open up opportunities to let Devin White and those guys clean up the inside the inside of the play. And then if those guys happen to win and get one-on-one matchups because they're worried about the outside edge rushers, even better. We we touched on it a little bit, the secondary, top to bottom. It, it's it's kind of asinine how good it is, uh, the, the talent mm-hmm. that's all the way around there. But, you know, you get – to be completely honest, Quin, Quinion Mitchell was my CB1 and, and, and Cooper Jean was my CB3. So that still remains just insane to me. But there's a lot of people that want to pigeonhole DeGene as a safety. I, I, mm-hmm. I think he can play. I think he's a weapon. I think he, mm-hmm. he reminds me a little bit of what Grant Delpit can do in Cleveland in a sense where you can put him in the slot. You can play him as a box safety if you want to. You could probably put him back as a free safety, especially if you're in like a too high cover two, something like that. He can be one of those deep guys, that kind of thing. And he can play man in the slot and outside and that kind of thing. Where are you on where he should be used? Is he a safety? Is he a corner? Is he a, a little bit of everything? I think he's a safety and he's a nickel, you know, and he's a great athlete, but when you're playing the corner position, you there's a it's another it's a different type of athleticism that you need. It's, it's what I like to call reactive athleticism. Mm-hmm. If you see these videos of Tyree Kill getting toasted by high schoolers at his camps and girls, why do you think that is? That's one of the most athletic, one of the fastest dudes on the planet, and he's getting toasted by a girl at his camp. Well, because he's not a reactive athlete, he's a pure athlete. When he's making the decision on where he's going, he's incredible. When he's having to react to what someone else is doing, he's not. That's kind of where I see Cooper. Cooper's not as as bad of a reactive athlete as Tyreek is, right? But you can see in when he's in man coverage situations, which Iowa didn't play a whole lot, he's not very reactive. Yeah. But when he has the ball in his hands as a punt returner, he's an excellent athlete. So I think he's more of a, a raw, pure athlete as opposed to a reactive one. And that's why I would want him as my nickel or safety 
as opposed to on the on the boundary playing corner. Um, because I just I think that keeping him in the box or even putting him in back in as a free safety, that's fine too. You're gonna get a bet you're gonna utilize his skill better because he's gonna know where he's going with the ball, especially if he's roving. He's chasing the ball. He's not reacting to a wide receiver, you know, not not very often at least. So I like him as a safety much better for those reasons. And hey, white guys can't run. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. He's given us all hope. <laughs> well, my, my question is along the same lines, same player. When I look at building a defense, and the Eagles are a prime example of this, uh, you can call them math changers, I call them whiteboard players. Players that when offensive coordinators are going over their meetings for the week, they're circling guys, like keep an eye on, you know. And I think DeGene has that capability because of his ability to be multiple. Because, like you said, you could bring him up, play nickel, put him in a slot, you can overhang linebacker, put him at free safety. Does the latitude in Vic Fangio's defense exist for a player like him just to be a movable chess piece? Absolutely. It does. And because this goes right back into uh, disguised coverages. So Vic's going to disguise everything that he does. And that's why I was saying he's going to be in a one high look, right? And he's going to operate everything out of a one high look. That's really what he does. That's his forte. And so when you're in one high in pre-snap, that gives you a lot of flexibility as to what you can run. You can back the corners off into three late. They bail. Now you're in cover three. You can shift the safety over one way or another, back another one there. Now you're in two, right? So it's all about changing the picture post-snap and trying to confuse the quarterback as to what's open and what's not, right? Because if he's reading one high every single play, he understands that he has to know how many defenders are bailing, who's bailing, Mm -hmm. Who's moving across the field? Brandon Staley took it another step farther when he was with the Rams in dropping guys all over the place and doing all kinds of crazy stuff with his disguises because he had a secondary that was capable of moving all over the place. Well, Vic has that secondary now, right? So, yeah, no, there's there's plenty of room for him to be versatile in Vic's defense. And Vic loves these types of players because Cooper can blitz. Cooper can play the rover, he can play in the nickel, and he can play deep coverage. So that means that that he can put him up, line him up all over the formation and drop him, bail, blitz, sit him in the hook, sit him in the curl, whatever that has to do, whatever he has to do to fit that assignment, Cooper's going to be able to do all that. So Vic's going to love this guy. I think he was probably jumping at the the bit when they got that pick and he was still on the board. Um, that's all assuming too, that his injury, his medicals are good because that's probably why he fell out of the first round. Um, but yeah, you get to add him to your boundary corners when you know Quinion Mitchell is going to be on one side and Darius Slay is going to be on the other. You got James Bradbury in the wings and Eli Ricks and, and, uh, Josh Joby all, all biting at the bit to play. Like yeah. it's a very, very deep secondary and it gives you a lot of flexibility, especially when injuries start happening to plug in players and rotate him across the board. Cooper definitely fit. De- Cooper's going to be playing all across the board. I can't. I couldn't imagine seeing it any other way. I and you just casually were like, "Hey, CJ Gardner Johnson, you can just come on back." Yeah. See, there's another one. Mm-hmm. Just casually, we're just like, "Yeah, fuck mm-hmm. it, we'll bring him back." Like, and you're like, "Are you?" I just, I, it's, cr- yeah. Sometimes my brain malfunctions a little bit when I look at just the names and the talent that he has at his disposal. You talked about the difference. I think you're going to see such a difference in what he was in Miami last year and what he's going to be with Philadelphia. And I think it's day one. I don't even think it's like, Mm -hmm. and I don't think it's a little bit. I think it'll just be like, hey, by the way, I'm one of the best in the business at doing this. Mm -hmm. And here you go. I think it's just like Jim Schwartz did last year. Exactly. I think it's the same thing because Jim Schwartz, and of course in the first game with the Browns, you know, there were some injuries and some weather, but right out the gate, Jim Schwartz's defense is just smothering dudes. I think it's the same thing. I think it happens the same way in Philadelphia just because of the personnel and everything lining up. I want to bring well, this. It's not just because the personnel lines up. It's the fact that they wanted him last year to be the defensive coordinator and they kept built, bringing the pieces in Howie. Roseman at the general manager yeah. to make sure that it was going to be enticing for him when he came back next year. It's like, Hey, 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 you sure you want to come? <laughs> you want to come <laughs> more and more of this. The guy's doing these consulting roles. Like, cause mm-hmm. that's what he was doing mm-hmm. 
for you guys during your Super Bowl run. And it just, mm-hmm. you know, I, I just, you're, we're, we're actually benefiting now because this year we get Mike Vrabel as a consultant, which is like a cheat code. Mm-hmm. Like to have that kind of dude around the around the, the team and, and in meeting rooms and bouncing ideas off coaches. It's I think it's what we're going to see when – because defensive coordinators or defensive-minded coaches, when they lose their jobs, they're not as coveted as the new hot offensive guy. So there's room for these guys to kind of do like these like pseudo internships and kind of stay involved with the game. And, and, and you see it paying off now, you know, and you're seeing now Fangio, we had it with Schwartz. I think you're going to see it next year with Vrabel as well. No. And, and the, the consulting thing is exactly what you just said. It's to stay in the game. You take a year off of the game and you try to come back into it and it's totally different. Because it's evolving that fast, you know. So when you take a year off, you see a lot of guys struggle to come back to a good role. And it's that's why, because they've been out of the game for a year and they get out of the sink and out of the loop. And uh, like Greg Williams is a great example of a guy. He was a defensive coordinator. They got fired. He took a year off. He's not even back in the NFL. He's in the XFL with the D.C. Defenders and has been the last two years. And he loves it, you know. But that that's just an example of, a, a coordinator getting fired, taking a year off, and he was so far out of the game, nobody wanted to bring him back into the fold. You know, I I met Greg Williams in the Muni lot last year. We were both blue. Greg, Greg's a, Greg's a friend of mine. He's awesome. I love Greg. <laughs> dude was dude was partying it like it was no. It was amazing. I was just I did shots with him. It was like it was like all right, let's do it, dude. Dude's a lot. Greg fun. Greg is awesome, and he'll he's he's one of the most honest dudes in, in football too. He'll just tell you exactly like it is just like Vic, honestly, like those two are very, very similar cut from the same cloth. Um, mm-hmm. Let's bring it full circle, man. Let's wrap this thing up, bring it full circle. If you were putting money on it right now, how many, how many games do you think Philly wins this year? We're, and, we're, and we'll do the thing where we say no major injuries or anything like that. If things go right, where do you have them at the end of the season? Yeah, if things go right, I think 13-4 and four is probably in the mix. You know, because um, the, the defense can carry a lot of the games, especially if the offense is struggling, um, which you wouldn't expect this offense to struggle. It really hasn't the last couple of years. If you go back to even the losing streak, yeah, it had its moments, but they were still scoring points. You know, so it was the defense giving up more than they could account for. But, you know, they're, they're a very high-scoring offense. They've got a lot of weapons. There's a lot of depth that they can kind of mix in there for the matchups. And then the defense is so deep with this coordinator, it should, it should mesh really well. If things don't go as well, if the offense really struggles, Moore really kind of doesn't get vibe too well with Hurts. And now we're talking about, is Hurts the, cool, the long-term answer in Philadelphia? Is Kenny Pickett going to get a shot? You know, I do think that that's something that potentially could come down the road. If things go poorly, we're probably talking about an eight and nine, nine and eight season for Philadelphia. I think that's probably worst case. All right. Well, let's let's talk. Let's have the uncomfortable question. So the honeymoon is over between Nick Sirianni and the fan base. Now, sometimes the fan base has a hard time realizing that's because they're over. It doesn't mean the front office is over. So say that worst mm-hmm. case scenario happens and they finish eight and nine. Is that enough for the Eagles to move off Sirianni? And if so, would they just promote more at that point? That's a great question. It depends. You know, so the one thing that makes Sirianni a great head coach, and at least to have the success that he's had up to this point, and that's, I think that's great when you consider it. He's never been a head coach before. A couple of years off as a coordinator, goes to a Super Bowl. That's not something that just happens every day. You know, so that's a great run that he's had so far. What makes him so great is he is a true uh, delegator. He doesn't try to take over the offense. He doesn't try to take over the defense. He doesn't try to get in the way. He makes the final decisions and makes those and works with the coaches. He lets everybody do their job. Mm-hmm. So that's what makes Nick such a great head coach. Okay. So if if things go wrong, the the actions that they've undertaken with their coaching staff this year would suggest that this is his last shot, right? To get it back where it needs to be because their personnel is good. The roster looks great on paper. They're deep. They can handle injuries at just about any position. Okay. So I think that if you, if you come into this with a losing season, how he's going to have no choice, but to say, look, it was great. We went to the Super Bowl. That was fun, but we got to go find somebody else. 
And I'm not so sure, and I think this is why Kellen hasn't gotten that shot yet, people aren't sure that he can let go of the offense and let somebody else run it. Um, so I don't think that they would necessarily promote from inside. If you look at the history of Philadelphia, especially with Howie Roseman and him hiring coaches, he's never promoted from within. Um, he's always gone out. When they let Andy Reid go, um, it was Chip Kelly from Oregon. When yep. Chip went, it was Doug from Cle- from Kansas City who was working with Reid. And when they let Doug go, it was Sirianni from Indianapolis. So they don't hire from within. That's not really – Nick was kind of the first person to start bringing up these coordinators when they got pulled from him. But because they replaced both the coordinators, that tells you that, hey, this is a hot seat. And if things don't go right this year – we're going to have to go find somebody else who can manage this roster better. Well, man, it's been a hell of a time talking to you tonight. We really appreciate you jumping on here with us. Um, I feel smarter. I don't know if I like, like I feel smarter and also feel like I know less about football than I thought I did. So like, it's like a combination (laughs) of the two, just like a train hitting each other. Fuck. But that was a great episode. No, just, but seriously, man, before we get off there, just let everybody know where they can find your stuff. Well, I'll tell you real quick. I get around some people, and I feel like I don't know anything about football, too. You know, I, I've been blessed to be around some great, awesome people that know a lot. They've forgotten more football than, I'll, than I remember at this point in my life. Um, <clears throat> the very first game that I went to, I was sitting there with Patrick Wu, who was the, the – uh, Coordinate, scouting coordinator for the Titans, um, Mark Orsak, who's on the pod with us, longtime student scout, combine 40 starter, and the Mississippi State defensive line coach. And the conversation that they were having about football, I think I took 10% of it away from him. Like I just <laughs> was not picking up on, on the jar again. You know what I'm saying? Oh, so yeah. football is one of the most ama- is the most amazing sport. Uh, to me because of the depth of it and the depth of the knowledge that you can Mm -hmm. obtain, not just from a historical statistical standpoint, that's what makes baseball so great is the history, right? Yeah. But football has the history, but it also has the constant evolution of the, just Mm -hmm. the the sheer amount of ways that you can play the game. Mm -hmm. And there's no sport that is as deep in so many different places that you look at it from a scouting evaluation standpoint, from, you know, a positional, just a coaching standpoint, from a, a schematic standpoint and from a historical standpoint, there's nothing that's close to football. It doesn't rival anything. So don't feel bad, okay? You're learning. You're going to get there, right? I get there sometimes and I'm like, yeah, I don't I don't know what, I don't know half of this. By the time but, we get there, it'll change um, again. It'll just keep yeah, right. rolling. And it, it's a never that's why, possible. that's literally... That's literally what it is. You got to just keep up with the evolution. Just keep up with it. And if you can do that, you're going to be able to keep up with the game. And and you'll be catching on the, all this charming and stuff. The the evolution of the game is the most important aspect of understanding it. Uh, but you can follow me at Draft Vogel on X, Twitter, whatever we're calling it now. Uh, my show is at NFL Draft uh, at Sick Pod NFL Draft, and then um, I've got everything that you could get there. I just launched draftvogel.com to kind of promote some of the stuff that I'm doing um, today or as a day recording drops my quarterback rankings for the, uh, the pre the preseason rankings. And um, they're not, it's not a one, two, three, four list. I made that mistake last year. I'm never doing that again. It's a tier system. So as a, who's a starter, who's a future starter, so on and so forth. And uh, it's a little bit of a sneak peek to what's inside the guide as well. Where can they get your draft guide? You can get it. Go go to draftvogel.com, and the link is everywhere. Trust me. You'll be able to get it there. <laughs> Do it. I mean, like, I just dropped my first uh, three-round Browns mock of the year uh, this morning. So, like, it's never too early to start reading draft guides. <laughs> like, it's <laughs> – and this quarterback class is so – we won't get into it, but it's such a weird <laughs> class in my opinion. Another pod. I, I, we, that's that's a pod in the in the distant future. But guys, thank you so much for uh, stopping in. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Uh, we got a bunch of stuff coming out this week. Uh, our fifty three man roster. By the time this pod drops, the fifty three man roster prediction for the Browns will be next Tuesday. Um, 
I think that when Casey loses, he's going to have to eat a bunch of tomatoes. Oh, you. So, yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. So we appreciate hey, you Hey, so assistity, assistity, assistity. Be careful. <laughs> he's afraid of them. Anyway, we... It, oh, it's... I was just I was just quoting um, um, Al Davis actually, so <laughs> assistity, assistity, assistity. Anyway, uh, it's just right over my head. I was like, oh yeah, no, okay. but we'll see you guys again next time. As always, go Browns. <laughs>